are aware of this parable. It's, uh, it's an old parable. It was actu- actually uh, came upon the scene hundreds of years before Jesus Christ was born uh, on the subcontinent of India. And uh, it's a parable that was well known amongst uh, that part of the world and has spread across the world. Uh, it is about uh, six blind men and an elephant. Six blind men and an elephant. And uh, this parable over the years has been used in a lot of different circles uh, to apply to different situations and to illustrate and teach different things. And I want to tell you about this parable this morning for those of you particularly who may not be aware of this poem. It's about these six blind men who heard that a new animal had come into their village, an animal they'd never heard of. They didn't know anything about its shape or size. They just knew its name was elephant. They were blind and they were deaf, but they agreed somehow, as the parable goes, that they wanted to investigate this new animal to try to figure out what it must look like. And so they agreed to find the elephant, and then through the one medium that they all had, which was touch, that they wanted to touch this elephant and figure out what this elephant must look like and what it must be like. And so these six blind men went and found the elephant, and they kind of all got it a different place around the elephant, and they began to touch the elephant. The first man, the first blind man that touched the elephant, uh, touched the tusk of the elephant. And, uh, and this blind man felt the tusk, and he said, it's, it's hard, it's like a cylinder, it's got a, it's got a point on the end of it. It must look like a spear. That's what an elephant looks like. An elephant looks like a spear. Another one of the blind men, his hand fell upon the trunk of the elephant. And as he felt the round, long trunk of the elephant, he he thought and he thought, this feels just like a very thick snake. That's what the elephant must be like. The elephant looks like a thick snake. The third blind man, his his hands fell upon the, the ear on the elephant's head and he felt the thinness and the breadth of the ear and he felt how the elephant tried to move the ear to to kind of just move back and forth and he thought it's a fan that's what an elephant looks like an elephant looks like a fan and so then another another one of the blind men he he stood there and and he and he, and he felt the side of the elephant and, and his hands went all over the he, said, he felt the, how, tense, how dense it was and how he tried to push on it and he couldn't. He said, this feels like a wall. That's what an elephant looks like. An elephant looks just like a wall. Well, another one of the, the, the blind men, he had stood there and he had wrapped his arm around one of the massive legs of the elephant. He felt how the, cylind- how the cylinder-like and the stoutness of it. And, and he thought of, the, of a trunk of a big tree. He said, that's what an elephant looks like. The elephant looks like the trunk of a big tree. And the last of the blind men, he felt the tail of the elephant. And he, and he said, you know, this, this feels like a rope. That's what an elephant's got to be. It's got to be just like a rope. And all of these blind men, from the experience that they had, conjured up in their mind what an elephant must be like. And of course, they were facing an impossible task because each of these men with minimal and limited knowledge of just a singular aspect of the elephant, it was impossible, it was hopeless that they could understand what an elephant really was. Well, Pastor Chris and I recognize that that we cannot assume that the majority of those who live in Northern Virginia know God. 
know who he is or know what he's like. And, and most people who have had no, no relationship to the Bible are in a hopeless situation. Hopeless in trying to understand God, who he is and what he's like based on what limited information they might have. So we decided we were going to preach a six-sermon mini-series on the topic, Who is God? And over the last three Sundays, we have, we have looked at, at God's existence, how the, the world, the created world, shouts that God exists. And that while man wants to hold down the truth of God's existence and suppress that truth because of his own love for sin... God has a passion and desire to save man from his sin and to deliver him from the power of sin in his life, freeing him from that sin. We've learned that God is a person. And we can know some things about him because he created us in his image. And so we've learned that particularly in our before sin state, in our pre-fall state, man Created in the image of God reveals that God is a person who is very intelligent and is very moral. Then last week, we considered the mystery of how God exists as a trinity of beings. One God who exists as three individual people who are related in a mysterious union as three distinct, distinct people being one God. Mysterious? Yes. Impossible to fully fathom and understand? Most definitely. True? Absolutely. Because we learned from the Bible last week that the Word of God declares our one true God exists as a mysterious union of three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. This morning, we are delving into the question, what is God like? This God that exists, that creation shouts to us that he exists. This God who created us in his image, who exists as a, as a trinity of persons who are very intelligent and very moral. Uh, this, this, who, what is this God like? How can we know this God and understand what he's like. And that's the human challenge that we have. Our challenge to human beings is to know God. To know the God who created us. Who he is. And what he's like. And so the bottom line up front of the message this morning. My challenge to you. Is take ownership. Of your responsibility. To know God. To know him intimately. To not only know who he is, but to know what he's like. And to endeavor to own the lifetime responsibility of knowing God. I ask you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 9. I want you to look down to verse number 23. Jeremiah was a preacher of the Old Testament at a strategic time in Israel's history. And in one of his messages, in general. Jeremiah chapter 9 in verse number 23, God gave him a message. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth. And knoweth me that I am the Lord which exerciseth loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. I want a statement from God that God made to Jeremiah for him to deliver to the people of God in and around Jerusalem. It is natural for a person who is highly educated to take a certain amount of, of pride in what he's attained educationally. 
the wise man glorying in his wisdom. And that, that's, that's rightfully important. A person who has spent a lot of time studying a particular topic or developing a certain, um, a certain skill or a certain understanding of some, some area of life, for that person to take some satisfaction in that, that he achieved some level of notoriety for all the wisdom and knowledge he'd gained. But God says, I've got something that trumps that. If you're going to glory, don't glory in the number of letters after your name. Don't glory in your degrees and the attainment that you reach. As important as that is, if you're going to glory over something, I'll give you something that is infinitely more important to glory in. Glory in this, that you understand me, that you know me. As important as it is to be proud of educational accomplishments, it's infinitely more important to expend the time and the energy and the money and the effort to understand God. There are those who take a lot of, uh, pay a lot of attention to their physique. They'll go to the gym and work out. They'll, they'll be careful what they eat. They'll exercise. They'll build strength. And they will become mighty in physical strength. Their body is buff. They are strong, and some will take pleasure in that and be proud of that. They'll strut around because look at that individual. Look at that strong person. And God said, you know, if you've put in the time, you've pumped the iron, you've watched your diet, you've run and exercised, you've done all that it takes to be healthy and to take care of your physical body and to have physical strength. Yeah, you, that's, that's good to, be, to have some, some level of, of pride in your accomplishment. But God says, I want to trump that. As important as that may be, there's something infinitely more valuable to be proud of. Be proud of the fact that you've invested the time and the effort and the energy to understand me and to know me. And some have worked hard to, to save money. They have worked hard to be able to get a job that paid them well. They worked hard to not spend everything they got. They made careful financial decisions. They didn't spend everything that they got their hands on, but they saved, they worked, and, and, and they, they have put together a portfolio that's going to sustain them and their family should they lose their job or should they grow older and retire and go into those years of not earning. And there's something to be said for that. The Bible honors that, encourages people to make wise decisions, to not spend everything they get to save, and to prepare for the future. But God says, as much as it's tempting for a person who has done well in that way to be proud of their accomplishments, God said, I've got something that trumps that. That is to glory that you have spent the time and the effort and the energy. You've made the decisions. You've, you've put yourself in the places. You have, you have so orchestrated your life so that you could understand me and know me. That's what I want you to glory in. Because I, eternal God, delight in this, that you understand and know me. Wow. What a, um, what a truth to wrestle with and to take ownership of. The ownership of getting to know God. That's an ownership I want to encourage you to own up to. Your responsibility, more important than your education, more important than your buff body, more important than your portfolio in the financial realm, more important than all those, because all of that is temporal. It's only going to last for a little while. A hundred years from now, none of that will matter anything to you. But there is something that will matter to you a hundred years from now. And that's how well you took ownership of the responsibility to understand and to know 
God. Wow, what a responsibility to know God. Do you know God? How would you describe God if you were to, uh, to go to someone who didn't know God and they wanted you to explain? You know, we live in a very pluris, pluralistic world in part of America. There's a lot of people who don't know God who live in Northern Virginia. How would you describe God to them? How would you tell them what he's like? How would you explain to them why you believe what you believe about what God is like? Do you understand God? Do you know God well enough to help other people to understand and know God? To be sure, this is a lifelong pursuit, the pursuit of growing in my understanding of God. And so I want to make two statements. You have on your little worksheet there, two statements about studying the characteristics of God or the attributes of of God. The first statement is simple, just states you can know more about God through his attributes. You can know more about God through his attributes. What is an attribute of God? Jamie mentioned this morning that he enjoyed, as we were singing this morning, he enjoyed singing songs about the attributes of God. What was he saying? What is an attribute of God? Well, an attribute is simply a characteristic. Something that is a characteristic of the, the blind men trying to figure out what an elephant looked like, feeling the tusk and the, and the trunk and the, and the ear and so forth. They were, they were feeling physical characteristics or attributes of the animal, the elephant. And they were trying to understand the elephant as a result of the attributes, physical attributes of the elephant. When, when we speak of the characteristics or the attributes of God, we are trying to understand what is God like? What is God like? Charles Ryrie, in his book Basic Theology, expressed two thoughts about knowing God through attributes. He said, and they're listed as one and two in, uh, in the black print on your little worksheet this morning God is unknowable. In his fullness. You know we can study as much as we want about God. Trying to understand what God is like. Trying to study the attributes of God. The characteristics of God. But at the end of the day. And at the end of a lifetime. Of trying to understand and know God. We still will not fully understand and know God. He is beyond our human comprehension. God is more than the sub. Some total of all of his characteristics and attributes will never fully understand our God, this side of glory. We understand him through his attributes that he has revealed to us in his word. But even with all of those attributes, we'll still never fully understand him. Then a second statement that, that uh, second thought rather that Charles Ryrie uh, made was that each attribute describes the totality of God. Now that sounds theoretic, uh, you know, theological. It, it's a very simple statement. He, he said that each attribute describes the totality of God. The various attributes of God are not component parts of God. Each describes his total being. What does that mean? That means if an attribute or a characteristic of God is love, God is always loved through and through in every part of him. It's not love as one component. And sometimes he is love. But other times he is more like this. Justice. No, God is love all the time, everywhere, everything he says Everything he does is because of the characteristic of love, whom he is. At the same time, God is a God of justice and judgment. Which means every day, all the time, every place, at all times, and in every situation, God is always a God of justice. It's not that one day he's a God of love and the next day he's a God of justice. It's not sometimes he's this way and sometimes he's that way. Attributes or characteristics are not components that you put together and build a God on the basis of the components. In this study, 
Paul N. said in the Moody Handbook of Theology, in the study of God's attributes, it is important not to exalt one attribute over another. When that is done, it represents a, a, a caricature of God. It is all the attributes of God taken together that provide an understanding of the nature and person of God. God is not a being that we build by putting in him the attributes that we like. God is a being that is always every one of the attributes that he revealed in his word. You can't pick and choose and manufacture God to your liking. He is who he is and has revealed himself to us through a number of characteristics that we glean from the word of God. God is all of the attributes of God. He's not like the non-existent elephant that the blind men put together. He's not like this being that has this characteristic and this characteristic and this characteristic and this characteristic where one part of him is like a snake but that's different than his leg. His leg is like a tree. God is not a being put together by people who build a God out of the characteristics that they relate to as the non-existent elephant that the blind men in India portrayed in their parable. Rather, God is all of the attributes all of the time. The created world declares that God is and reveals some of his attributes, his majesty, his glory, his power. But the Bible declares much more about what God is like. It's filled with revelations of God. These are his attributes. This is the assignment God gives to us. More important than your education. More important than your physical uh, uh, strength. More important than your financial stability. More important than all of that. The temporal stuff of life. Is that you know me. And understand me. And that takes a lifetime of studying the word of God. To know God. God is unknowable in his fullness. But each of his attributes describes him in his totality. That that attribute is true of our God. So the first statement is you can know more about God through his attributes. The more you study the word of God. The more attributes of God you discover in your study of the word of God. The more you'll understand God. The more you'll know God. The second statement is this. You need to study God's word to be able to discover his attributes. You need to study God's word in order to understand the attributes of God. If you take ownership of the requirement to understand and know God, which God said is more important than education, physical strength, and financial security... If you will own the responsibility to understand and know God, that requires a study of the word of God in your life personally. To be able to discover and understand the characteristics of our God so that you can know him and understand him. In, in the Common Grounds class this morning, the uh, class is studying the book of Jeremiah. And uh, they uh, read, uh, Raj read a verse in Jeremiah chapter 2 where uh, the, the people in Jerusalem were really messing up really badly. And, uh, and he read a verse that said this. If I can find it, wrong page, here we go. Jeremiah chapter 2. The priest said not, where is the Lord? And they that, listen now, they that handle the law knew me not. You got a Bible in your lap this morning? Are you handling the word of God? That's not enough. Those that handled the word of God didn't know the God who wrote the book they were handling. The pastors also transgressed against me. And the prophets. See, it, that stage of time in the life of the Israelites in Jerusalem, they had the Bible. They handled the Bible. 
but they did not study the Bible that they handled. They did not know God. And Jeremiah's message in Jeremiah chapter 2 delivered God, as Jeremiah delivered God's message through the preacher, he challenged the people because they did not know him. You need to study the Word of God to discover His attributes. You know, when you, when you study the Word of God, you learn about God. That's, that's why we study the Word of God. We study the Word of God to know the author. We want to know the one who wrote this book. And throughout, we learn more and more of the characteristics or attributes of this amazing being. You know, at times, we learn a characteristic or an attribute about God that... that that I could never be like. I could never emulate that. And then there are other times we study attributes of God that, that God then tells me to become that in my own life. Well, let's divide them up in those two categories. You'll see a, a number one on your little worksheet that says God's attributes that you will never be like. There are some things you'll never be. You'll never, despite what the Mormons teach and, and other cults that teach that you can become God, you will never become God. You will be a glorified human being for eternity. You will never be God. There are some attributes and characteristics of God that, that we are in awe at our God. And we could never be like that. There's some of them listed there on your worksheet. Omniscience is one of them. That's one of the great attributes of God that we'll never be like. It's an attribute only of God. That is God is all-knowing. John, 1 John 1, uh, I'm sorry, 1 John 3, 20 states that God knows everything. He knows all things. God has all knowledge. You know what that does for me? That builds a lot of trust in my heart toward my God. God knows everything. God knows what's going to happen in my life tomorrow. God knows who's going to win the elections this fall. God knows what's going to happen to America in the next 15 years. God knows everything. You know what that builds in me when I get to know God and understand that my God is omniscient and knows everything? That builds my trust and my confidence. It builds my hope. It builds my relationship with my God when I understand my God is omniscient. God is omnipotent. That's another characteristic of God that I'll never become. That means all-powerful. The Bible tells us in Genesis 17, 1, God says, I am the almighty God. I have all might. I have all power. I am omnipotent. I can do anything because I am God. Wow, that is really exciting to me. You know how that's benefited me? Because God is omnipotent. He was powerful enough to save me from my sin. And because God is omnipotent, he was powerful enough to keep me saved after I got saved. And because my God is omnipotent, he's powerful enough to resurrect me from the dead one day. And he's powerful enough to enable me every day to live a life that's pleasing to him. Now, I just mentioned four practical things that I am benefited by a knowledge of the omnipotence of God. And all of those are found in the books of Romans, 1 Peter, 1 Corinthians, and Ephesians. Different statements and studying those portions of the word of God that point to the omnipotence of God as bringing this value to my life. A study of the attributes of God that I might understand and know God. Another attribute of God, something I'll never be like, is omnipresence. God is everywhere at the same time. I'll never be like that. Uh, even after I, I get a glorified body, I'm still going to be in a fixed body at a fixed location. I'm not going to be omnipresent like God. I'll never be like God. God is everywhere at the same time. The psalmist said, how can I get away from God? How can I get away from the presence of God? He said, if I go up to heaven, he's there. If I go to hell, he's there. If I go out to the middle of the ocean, he's there. I cannot get away from the presence of God because he's everywhere. I'll never be like that. But my God is like that. What great truth that is. You see, that's a 
source of comfort according to Acts 17. It's a source of constraint in Hebrews 4 because I know God is everywhere. Then he's right there when I'm tempted to sin and he's going to watch everything I do. That restrains me from doing something wrong. It's a source of restraint in my life when I understand the omnipresence of God. We used to teach little Sunday school kids, oh, be careful little hands what you do. Oh, be careful little hands what you do. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful little hands what you do. Oh, be careful little eyes what you see. Oh, be careful little eyes what you see. For the Father up in... Up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful little eyes what you see and tongue what you say and ears what you hear. What were we teaching Sunday school children? God is an omnipresent God. He's always love, but he's always justice. He's watching everything you do. He's looking down in love because he doesn't want you to do the wrong thing and bring judgment into your life because he's always love and he's always justice. And he's where you are right now, watching what you're doing. We teach the omnipresence of God to Sunday school children. You teach your kids in your home in order to be able to be a constraint to them. What does God's presence mean to me when I'm in disobedience? It means that God is my witness, jury, and judge like he was in Jonah's life. When in tragedy, God is my comfort like he was in Hagar's life as well as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When I'm in weakness, God is my strength as he was to Moses and Joshua. When I'm in victory, he's my supporter, my cheerleader as he was with Stephen. The omnipresence of God means God is always there and Practically, what that means to me at that moment depends on what I'm doing at that moment. He's always there. Here's another characteristic of God that I'll never be like. God is eternal. God, this omniscient, this uh, omnipotent, omnipresent God is eternal. No beginning, no ending. The psalmist said, before the mountains were brought forth or ever, thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. God has always been. I'll never be like that. I had a beginning. I'll never have an end, but I had a beginning. So I'll never be eternal. But God is eternal. He never had a beginning. And he'll never have an end. He is eternal. I've read, uh, there's a man by the name of Rolls who's long since gone of a different generation. He wrote some books on the characteristics of God and the names of God. And uh, one of his books, he, he told of a story that occurred in Paris, France. Now it would be well over 100 years ago. And in Paris, France, at that time, there was a deaf and dumb institution, an, an institute for people who were deaf and dumb. One of the inmates was given... The responsibility to write down what he understood the eternity of God to be. And what he wrote was profound. The eternity of God. He said eternity is duration without beginning or end. It's existence without bounds or dimensions. It's present without past or future. God's eternity is youth without infancy or old age. It's life without birth or death. It's light without sunrise or sunset. It's today without yesterday or tomorrow. God is eternal. Now, I'll never be like any of that. Those are characteristics of my God revealed in the pages of Scripture that impacts the way I live every day when I understand and know my God. But there's some other characteristics that, that are also characteristic of God that he then requires me to develop in my life serving him. You see those listed as God's attributes that, are in, that you were instructed to grow into. One of them is holiness. Holiness. The Bible in the Old and New Testaments in, in, in 1 Peter 1.16, quoting from the Old Testament, the Bible says, because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. God said, I am holy. I'm pure. I'm separated from evil. I am holy, holy, holy. The angelic beings around his throne cry out, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, holiness. But God says, because I'm holy and I've saved you from your sin, now I expect you to become like me and for you to become holy. 
That's within the realm of my possible attainment. I can become holy, and I will become holy. The Spirit of God's got a lot of work to do, and He works every day on that in my life. And that work will be complete when I step into the presence of Jesus Christ. First John chapter 3 tells me that I will be like Him, for I shall see Him as He is. That is something that is real in my life, that God is holy and that I can become holy. Holy as God is. God's holiness is reflected in his hatred for sin. And it should cause man to approach him with fear. That's why the fear of God is emphasized so much throughout the word of God. Thiessen said in lectures in systematic theology, holiness occupies the foremost rank among the attributes of God. It is the attribute by which God wanted to be especially known in Old Testament times. You'll find more stories and events and situations in the Bible that teach you God is holy than any of his other attributes. God's holiness, foundational. R.A. Torrey wrote about approaching God and said the entire Levitical system of sacrifices and coming into the presence of the Shekinah glory of God, coming into the presence of God through the, the means whereby God prescribed to Israel at Mount Sinai, uh, the details, the minutia of all of that underscored that God is unapproachably holy. And you can only approach him through very specific means because God is so holy. Be ye holy, even as I am holy. Another characteristic of God that is true of him that he expects to be true in my life is that God is a God of love. First John 4 declares God is love. God is always love. And love always seeks the good of the one loved. God always seeks the good of the ones whom he loves. Related to God's love is his mercy, goodness, kindness, long-suffering, and grace. He's always holy and he's always love. And how can holiness... And a love for an unholy person mesh together. It can only mesh together at the cross. There at the cross where finally at the cross of Calvary. Mercy and justice met. Amen. Righteousness and peace kissed. And a holy God's love for unholy man. Could come into a union of salvation. Because God paid the price to fix the problem of my unholiness. God is always love. And he's always a just God who requires a penalty for sin. And then the last of God's characteristics that I have listed there. The Bible's full of them. That This is a smattering of a few of the characteristics of God. The last one you have listed there is that God is an intimate God. He is an intimate God. He's a personable God. He's a God that condescends to, to have a relationship with mere mortals. He's a God of intimacy. Romans chapter 8 tells us that we can cry out to him, Abba, Father. This omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient God. This eternal being of holiness and justice and love. And this God is my daddy. I can call him Abba. He is an intimate God that wants a relationship with fallen man. That's his characteristic. He is a God of intimacy. And so when I go back to the text we started with in Jeremiah chapter 9, God says some people are proud of their education. And if you've worked hard for your education, you ought to carry a little bit of a, a sense of accomplishment. That, that's, that's fine. Some people uh, glory in their physical strength. They have pumped iron. They have exercised. They've ran. They've ran. They've ran. They have not eaten what other people eat. And, and they are very careful. And they have... A right to be, to feel good about the fact that they have developed their physics, physical body. And some people have quite the portfolio. And when they get ready to stop working, they have enough to take care of their family. 
and they are secure financially and they feel good about that. They've made wise decisions. They've done good things. But all of that is going to end at the blink of an eye. But what will never end for all of eternity is how well did you understand God? How well did you know God? And so God said, that should be the height of our glory and our effort and our energy and our pursuit to understand and to know God. 27 years ago when Community Baptist Church came into being, we established as a vision statement, our passion is to know God and to make Him known. Our passion as a church is that the members of Community Baptist Church would own the responsibility of understanding and knowing God, which is only possible through a personal, intense study of the Word of God in your private life. You'll get a tidbit or two from the hour or two you spend in church a week, but you'll never understand God on the basis of what you get at church. You will know God on the basis of your owning the responsibility to study the Word of God and thus to know God. As your pastor, it's my duty to God and it's my duty to you to do all I can to enable you to know God. To be able to encourage you to know God. To own the responsibility of knowing God. That's why I set up our weekly prayer sheets the way I did years ago. As one little thing that I do to try to help you in your pursuit to know God. Every week on your prayer sheet, there's a title that says, what is God like? And there's usually two, sometimes one, of God's attributes. The prayer sheet you received from your Bible study fellowship class teacher this morning that I hope you have in your Bible there on your person right now. You'll see that the two attributes of God that are on your prayer sheet this week is that God is a God of comfort and a verse of scripture where we learn that from God's word. And then that God is eternal and four passages of scripture that teach that from God's word. Why do, I do, why, why do I have the prayer sheets out every week? Because I have a duty to God. And I have a duty to you. To do everything I can. To help you own the responsibility. Of understanding and knowing God. And you can't understand and know God. If you don't know from his word. What his characteristics are. And so I ask you every week. Would you take a little bit of time this week in your personal devotions to talk to God. Maybe look up the verses and see in the Bible where those attributes are taught. And talk to God about who he is, what he's like. Talk to him about what it means that he's a God of comfort. What does it mean to you that he's an eternal God? And talk to God and meditate on the attributes of God because a study of God's word will help you to understand and know God. And it's my responsibility as your pastor to do what I can to help you take that ownership and to give you practical tools to be able to accomplish that. And that's why you received a prayer sheet in your BSF class this morning with two attributes to encourage you to think about those attributes this week and think about our God, an eternal God who is a God of comfort to me and my family. And so I would encourage you as a church family, let's be students of the Word of God. Let's read our Bibles every week, seeking to better know God. Seeking to better understand God. For it's in our personal study of the Word of God that we will grow in our understanding and our knowledge of God. And God says, that's what I delight in. That's what you can be proud of, that you understand me and that you know me. What is God like? You've got a book and you've got a lesson assignment from God. 
you can find out what he's like. Thank you for joining us for part of a Sunday service at Community Baptist Church. I hope to meet you soon. May God impress his love upon your heart this week.